move on quickly to our next speaker, who's um, Glenn Gibbons. And he also has a very prestigious little blurb about him. And he's going to talk to us about damages and other remedies arising from copyright liability of online content, platforms and social media, etc. So thank you very much, Glenn. Um, you have the same time with the same little bit of leeway that I gave. Great. Okay. Um, good afternoon, folks. Um, the theme of my talk really uh, is the uncertainty um, in terms of remedies um, in this area, particularly caused by the IP Enforcement Directive, and I'll look at that in a moment with respect to um, damages and a recent uh, English judgment on the issue of damages. But if you look at the issue of uncertainty, there clearly is, over the last decade or so, uncertainty when it comes to the liability particularly the injunctive liability uh, in respect of intermediaries. And then, as I said, un uh, uncertainty caused by the IP enforcement directive itself. The, in terms of intermediaries, a brief historical perspective, the uh, Copyright Act, as you know, um, the injunct 2000, the injunct the, that led to the EMI versus UPC judgment of Judge Charlton in 2010, where he held there was a lacuna <coughs> under Section 40. That judgment resulted in a Frankovich style damages case by the uh, music industry against the state, which resulted in SI 59 of 2012, which uh, was the purported method of dealing with that lacuna, which amended section 40 of the 2000 Act. The music industry then brought uh, the subsequent case mentioned by own uh, Sony versus UPC, um, a judgment of last year, a judgment by Mr. Justice Cregan, which also raised thorny issues, uh, particularly in relation to the issue of costs, who's going to pay for the scheme. And Mr Justice Cregan held that the uh, defendant, UPC, be 80% liable for the costs. And the costs um, evidence was, about, I think, 800,000 or so, hundreds of thousands of euro. The, so it's clear from, um, in terms of liability against uh, intermediaries in terms of the injunctive sphere, that things aren't over. And it's also clear that the safe harbour principle and the takedown notice gives rise to uh, difficulties, um, as mentioned earlier on, um, and also exemplified by the Californian case of Lens versus uh, Universal, which you may or may not be familiar with, the dancing baby case where the young child dancing uh, and, uh, to Prince in the background, music by Prince, and that was uploaded by a mother onto um, YouTube taken down at the request of the uh, right holder, uh, Universal, and then the mother complains that put it back up, YouTube put it back up, and litigation uh, ensued. And arguably, um, the well, it's not arguable, the intermediary is the piggy in the middle in all of this and has to make a decision on a case-by-case -case analysis, but uh, given the lack of certainty, uh, one may argue that um, a risk-averse approach has, uh, has been adopted for obvious reasons. When one comes to the IP enforcement directive then in relation to intermediaries uh, and online content platform, and I, similar to Fidelma, I, I, I found that's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, it's defined in the commission document in terms of what it includes, but um, it's quite wide-ranging, and I have it in my paper, which hopefully will be uh, sent later on today with the typos removed and, and uh, the IP enforcement directive has been around um, for uh, a while, but it's only in recent years that the English courts have engaged with it uh, in terms of analysis. The Irish courts haven't really uh, engaged with it uh, uh, very much, if, if at all, um, but the English courts uh, over the last couple of years have. And if you look first at damages, um, there's a very interesting judgment by uh, Mr. Justice uh, Haken, a, a case called Absolute Loss from last year, and that deals with the issue of damages for copyright infringement. The facts briefly were that the uh, plaintiff took a case against um, another loft company for use of 20 odd images taken from the plaintiff's website, copied and pasted and put on the defendant's website. The plaintiff was successful in alleging copyright infringement flagrant breach of uh, the photographs and, and of the copyright. And the analysis traditionally would have gone if it was a 
uh, left to domestic law would have been damages on the basis of the user principle, but the court went further and awarded damages under Article 13 of the IP Enforcement Directive. The Are you okay? Okay. Um, so, in terms of the user principle, which is the orthodox approach to damages for copyright infringement, the court awarded a relatively small sum of £300, but went on then to award £6,000 on the basis of uh, Article 13 of the IP Enforcement Directive. That begs the question, what does Article 13 allow? Well, uh, the answer to that is it's not terribly clear. Um, and if one reads the judgment... Uh, Judge Haken states um, on 13, um, Article 13 1A is concerned with the profits that the right holder has lost. Aside from the actual profits lost by the right holder, the compensation awarded can take into account unfair profits made by the infringer and non-economic loss by the right holder, in particular moral prejudice. Likewise, under Article 13 1B, aside from the uh, notional license royalty which would have been paid to the right holder, the compensation award can also take into account unfair profits and non-economic non loss, such as moral prejudice. Now, Article 13 only applies where the, uh, the infringement was done knowingly or um, uh, with reasonable grounds to believe that. Uh, so it's, it's limited to that category. <coughs> so you can see Article 13 has sort of upset the apple cart to a certain degree in terms of the traditional approach to damages for copyright infringement and in a favourable way, arguably, for the plaintiff and in some ways, it, it brings us into the same analysis as damages for trademark infringement, uh, where uh, the principle is that a court needs the, uh, to quote uh, an old phrase, a sound uh, imagination and the exercise of a broad axe in terms of calculating damages. So I think Article 13 uh, has a similar type of analysis going forward. In terms of Nor uh, Norwich uh, Pharmacal Orders, uh, Owen has touched on a number of the recent English judgments and Mr Justice Arnold in, in England uh, in recent years has engaged in that analysis uh, of uh, calibrating the rights of IP holders versus uh, the charter ECHR rights. Uh, you might say on a token basis or uh, you know what the answer will be when you, when you read the uh, five pages of the analysis, uh, it'll be that property rights will trump um, and, and invariably that is the case. Um, Irish courts, when they deal with the issue, uh, arguably have a, a more uh, uh, a longer history of calibrating rights in terms of proportionality and so on, and with respect to Bunrock and Heron, um, and and was done by Mr. Just, Justice Cregan to a certain degree uh, in the Sony judgment. But interestingly, in the uh, Dramatico Entertainment uh, judgment, uh, Mr. Justice Arnold. dealt with proportionality and, and uh, third party uh, uh, and, and third parties and he held that in terms of consent orders it wasn't good enough just for the parties to, to, to come to consent orders that um, I think the phrase he used was it, the court shouldn't rubber stamp uh, such orders but the court should engage with the actual text and, and form of the orders and consider whether they are proportionate to the individual um, alleged infringers. Yes, in that case, Mr. Just Arnold examined the draft order and modified it in a number of aspects. Rather than allowing a predetermined sum in the draft letter uh, to be sent to every intended defendant, Mr. Justice Arnold ordered that each settlement sum be individually negotiated with each uh, intended night, uh, defendant, uh, which <coughs> obviously raises the complexity of, of, of the matters. The, another relief, and perhaps the most novel relief available under the IP enforcement uh, directive from uh, an Irish or an English perspective, is the publicity order. And that, uh, there's no reported judgment on the issue in Ireland, as far as I'm aware. The English courts have, over the past decade or so, uh, dealt with it in, in numerous contexts and uh, have managed to distill uh, a number of principles from those judgments. 
And if I could just go through those. First, uh, if an order is given, reference to the judgment is often required in the losing party's website for a period. Secondly, the length of the notice period depends on the particular facts of each case. So, for example, in Samsung, um, the period one, was one month, whereas in Redwood, three services, uh, Red Bull and also 32 Red PLC, the period was six months. So it clearly depends on the nature and extent of infringement. Uh, thirdly, different standards should not apply depending on whether it's the plaintiff or the defendant who seeks a publicity order. So in Brigade uh, versus uh, Backtech, uh, Mr. Pierce, who was a QC at the time, uh, now a High Court judge in, in England, held in applying the principles laid down in Samsung that in order to have a proper basis for making a publicity order, the party requesting the order should place some material bef uh, before the court in order to support the making of such an order. The content of such material uh, is not teased out in the judgment, but this effectively is material um, exemplifying the infringement. In the same judgment, the court noted that if a plaintiff seeks a publicity order, it can hardly complain if the court makes the converse order in, in favour of the defendant. So if the defendant successfully defends a uh, copyright infringement action or an IP action, uh, what's good for the goose, the defendant can turn around and say, well, hold on a moment, I want a publicity order on the plaintiff's website. Uh, also, there was an attempt uh, in Red Bull uh, versus uh, Sun Mark to have parts of the judgment only linked on the website. I think there was a concern about <coughs> evidence and concern, adverse comments were, that were made in the judgment. But that was rejected by the court. The court said no, the entire judgment, uh, the hyperlink will be the entire judgment and not selected parts of the judgment. It might be terribly relevant online, but ordering publication in national newspapers is also case law to say that it's unnecessary where a case has attracted uh, publicity in the, in the press. And that makes perfect sense. If I can step outside the, the IP enforcement directive <coughs> for a moment and mention a further uh, English judgment that, that's of importance uh, from last year, and that's Mr. Uh, Justice Bears's judgment in Omnibill uh, Limited which concerns the jurisdiction of the English courts for copyright infringement. Uh, there have been a number of trademark judgments in recent years um, dealing with the jurisdiction of the English courts to deal with trademark infringement. This judgment adopts that logic and implants it into copyright. And, and that the element of analysis uh, is whether the website is targeted at uh, particular states. This website uh, was, uh, let's say, for adult, adult services, well, for escort services. Uh, it was um, based in, uh, or South African, uh, but held ultimately to be targeted at, at, at the UK, or partly targeted at the UK. And uh, Mr. Justice Burris adopted, as I said, the approach uh, in trademark uh, law uh, and held um, that the real issue is whether the website is targeted at a particular jurisdiction. He stated uh, paragraph 12 of his judgment, I'll just read out the quote, it is clear that the question of whether a website is targeted to a particular country is multifactorial, uh, one which depends on all the circumstances. Those circumstances include, include things which can be inferred from looking at the content of the website itself and elements arising from the inherent nature of services offered by the website. The court further accepted and this, I think, is novel, or the first time it's been addressed. I don't think it's been addressed uh, elsewhere in IP infringement. The court accepted that a website may be targeted at more than one state. So it's not all or nothing. Uh, it can be that um, a website liability can be held in a number of different member states, depending uh, on the website. And Mr Justice Barris held that that's particularly true of English la uh, language websites, um, given, of, of course, the prevalence of of English and also the number of jurisdictions that, uh, that use English as a primary language. So the paper goes into matters in a lot more detail, um, including Norwich Pharmacal Orders, but I don't want to go over that uh, 
rain again, given that Owen has covered it. Um, but I think whilst the IP enforcement directive is very helpful in summary, um, the, uh, it raises a number of issues, particularly that judgment in terms of damages, because the traditional approach to damages for copyright infringement, uh, and it was quite easy to calculate, it's now, I think, much more difficult to calculate. And, um, but, uh, uh, but from the plaintiff's perspective, probably much more uh, fruitful in terms of the ultimate damages awarded. I finished early, so I'm unusually yes, first. Thank speaker. you very much indeed. <laughs>